Joining me now is Democratic Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut. Uh, Senator, welcome back to the show. Thanks for taking time out tonight. What is the right lesson for Democrats to take away from last night's results? And what is the wrong lesson? Well, first of all, um, you know, we're less than 24 hours um, after these results. And so I'm not sure that I can you know, give you a comprehensive sermon on what the path for the Democratic Party should be going forward. You know, first, I, I want to make sure we don't overhype what happened yesterday. We lost. Um, but the party that controls the White House generally loses in these kind of midterm elections. There was going to be a swing in Virginia and New Jersey. It might have been bigger than we had hoped. Um, but, you know, in places like Connecticut and New Hampshire, we also picked up seats as well. I think if I can begin to answer your question, I'll go back to uh, something you referenced, which is um, the need for an origin story when it comes to explaining for Americans why their lives have become so difficult, right? Millions of Americans are struggling to pay their bills every week. They all of a sudden can't envision a life better for their kids than the life that they had. And as you mentioned, um, Republicans tell them why that is. Republicans make up this fiction about how minorities and immigrants are to blame, how Democrats are more focused on teaching college seminars on critical race theory in elementary schools than they are on economic well-being. Um, and Democrats have to understand that if we're not telling voters why, if we're not explaining to voters why that theory is wrong, but also what the actual explanation is for their suffering, um, then we're losing. And that story for Democrats is about the fleecing of America by millions Billionaires, billionaires, and corporations, the empowerment of Wall Street, the decision to hand massive profits to the drug industry and drive up drug costs yeah. for Americans. So, You've got to tell people who's fleecing them. You've got to tell people who's screwing them. Uh, and Republicans have been lying to folks about that narrative. Democrats have the actual story. We've just got to start telling it. So it's interesting you say that because I agree with you. I think you do need an enemy uh, in, a, in the loosest sense in terms of who is the person responsible for your plight or what is the corporation or policy that's responsible for your plight. And yet we've heard Senators Tim Kaine and Mark Warner, both of Virginia, your colleagues today, this situation would look much different had Democrats in Congress passed the infrastructure bill first, the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And I have to ask, you really think that offering people some new bridges would stop a 12-point wave across the state and deal with people screaming about their kids being lied to about critical race theory? Well, the day after these elections, everybody wants to come up with one explanation, uh, right? And, and that's not how elections happen. That's not how voters make their decision. There's always a confluence of factors that matter. Um, I listened to the same clip you played about my colleague Tim Kaine. I heard him to say that had Congress passed both the reconciliation bill and the Build Back Better agenda, maybe things would have been different. And I, I think that's probably true. Would it have been enough to make up the two or three or four points that ended up being the difference in Virginia? Not sure. But the fact that there was absolutely no time to sell incredibly popular measures and instead all of the emphasis being on the division within the Democratic Party certainly didn't help. So anybody on the day after an election that's looking for one single solution for what happened um, is probably fishing with the wrong pole. But I think that's part of the story. I mean, you and I both know there are people in your party, including Mark Warner of Virginia, who are suggesting progressives are to blame for not just passing one of those two bills. I agree with what you just said, that both bills passing together would have helped, but that was the issue, both bills passing together. One thing I don't seem to hear from any Democrats today is how to counter the GOP's and Fox's critical race theory and culture wars nonsense that has such traction on the right. You had a go a moment ago, but have a listen to a question Joe Biden got on this today. What's your message, though, for Democratic voters, especially black voters, who see Republicans running on race, education, lying about critical race theory, and they're worried that Democrats don't have an effective way to push back on that? Well, I think that uh, the whole answer is just to speak the truth, lay out where we are. Look, um, I'm convinced that if you look at everything from my view on the criminal justice system to my view on equal opportunity to my view on economic issues and all the things that I have and what I've been pushing in legislation, each of the elements are overwhelmingly popular. We have to speak to them, though. We have to speak to them and explain them. 
It's not exactly an ideal answer, not quite what you said a moment ago. We all know the Republicans are now going to be rolling out this critical race theory nonsense and race baiting uh, to every swing seat, every battleground state in the midterms and the presidential election. Surely your party needs to come up with a way to fight back without just saying, we're going to give you a tax credit or build a bridge. There needs to be uh, a much more emotional narrative on the Democratic side. Can we agree on that? Uh, no, I, I can't agree. You, you can't just tell people that we're giving you a $10,000 discount on your child care costs. That's going to be impressive to folks. you got to tell them why. We're doing that because we think the economy has been rigged. We think the government has been aligned to give billionaires and corporations everything and to give you nothing. And we're going to change that balance. We're going to tell these billionaires they got to pay their fair share so that you can make sure to be able to afford child care and to be able to go to work. we got to tell people why we're doing all this. We also can't take for granted uh, that people no issues like critical race theory are made up out of thin air. In Connecticut, we had a fight over critical race theory in a you know pretty moderate town along the Connecticut shoreline, a slate of Republicans that got uh, nominated on one single issue, their pledge to ban critical race theory teaching in schools in Guilford. Um, they lost two to one. Uh, they lost two to one because we didn't assume that voters knew that they weren't teaching critical race theory in our elementary schools in Guilford, Connecticut. We went out and explain to people how this was a, a complete mythology. So you also can't um, disengage from these fights. You've, you've, no, you've, you've got to be in it. You can't disengage, especially when, as I mentioned earlier, there is a propaganda machine on the other side. Earlier today, Senator, your colleague Joe Manchin called the re-inclusion of paid family leave in the Build Back Better bill a challenge for him. But he said he's working on a bipartisan bill with Maine Republican Senator Susan Collins. Isn't that the exact wrong lesson to take away from last night? Glenn Youngkin and the Republicans did not win Virginia by being bipartisan, by reaching out to Democrats all the time. Well, I, listen, I don't think that we should give up in reaching out to Republicans. I mean, my constituents in Connecticut, uh, you know, don't really care about process. They just want results. But uh, I think it's yes. better for democracy when we're, you know, frankly, finding some things that we can agree upon. But let's be clear, there's not going to be 10 Republican votes in the Senate for any meaningful paid family leave bill. Susan Collins, maybe one or two others may ultimately support that. But you will never get the 60 votes to overcome a filibuster if we want to join the rest of the high-income world and provide some level of pay to individuals, primarily women, who are home with a new baby or a sick relative, then we need to do it in reconciliation. I don't know whether ultimately this gets 50 votes in the Senate. Joe Manchin says it doesn't. But, uh, you know, if the inclusion in the House Bizarre. bill uh, potentially um, raises the I'm pressure and uh, allows some uh, room for a compromise, then, you know, maybe it's... Uh, uh, maybe it's a path forward. Just on Build Back Better, while all eyes were on yesterday's election, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer announced a deal on prescription drug pricing, Medicare negotiating those prices in the Build Back Better plan. I believe you were involved in those negotiations too. It's great news in theory, but in practice, it's much weaker than the House version. It doesn't kick in, I believe, until 2023 and only allows for Medicare to negotiate the price of 10 drugs. Is that really good enough right now or is that what it takes to get Kirsten Cinema and her pharma donors on board? So when FDR was negotiating the New Deal and pushing it through Congress, he had two to one majorities. Um, we are operating with 50 votes in the Senate. And so, uh, of course, we're not going to be able to get everything that the majority of Democrats would like. But this isn't just a camel's nose under the tent. This is a substantial reform to our Medicare system. Let me tell you exactly what it does. It's not 10 drugs, it's 20 drugs. Uh, and it's going to be the 20 most expensive drugs. It will allow for uh, us to use the bulk purchasing power of the federal government to negotiate down those drugs. You can't start it immediately just because of how uh, the Part D benefits um, uh, work, but we're going to start it as quickly as we can. We cap all price increases going forward on all drugs, no more price gouging. We cut in half the out-of-pocket expenses for all seniors to reach catastrophic coverage, and guess what? We don't pay for that with taxpayer money. We ask the drug companies to pay for that. Okay. Uh, th this is substantial reform, and uh, for the first time in 15 years, we get Medicare involved in driving down drug prices, 20 drugs, the most that's expensive drugs there are. That's a big deal.
That is a big deal. I recognize that. I just wish you'd gone further, but you make a valid point about majorities. Last quick question. We're out of time, but I have to ask you to react to the news today of a Pentagon watchdog finding no evidence of illegal action in the botched drone strike that killed 10 Afghan civilians, including seven kids in August. No sanctions for any of the commanders involved. Uh, you and I, last time you came on the show, we agreed that drone strikes are a massive problem. And yet here again, no accountability for a US drone strike killing innocent kids. What's your reaction? Briefly. Somebody needs to somebody needs to lose their job over this. Uh, I mean, it sends a chilling message to the chain of command when there is no accountability for this kind of mistake being made. Maybe there isn't criminal liability here, but there has to be prevention. Per, there has to be professional accountability because if the signal is sent to those that are operating America's drone program that you can botch a job this badly and still be in the business of running. Uh, weaponized drones over conflict areas, it's yes. an invitation for this to happen again. I hope someone's listening to you. Senator Chris Murphy, thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.